The shooter from El Paso this weekend is in custody now after having killed 22 people at least and having apparently uploaded a diatribe online echoing the rhetoric of the president's re-election campaign about a Hispanic invasion at the southern border and repeating lots of other long-standing white supremacist tropes that he says he learned about online. Federal prosecutors have already announced that that El Paso attack will be investigated as a potential act of domestic terrorism, and that killer will be tried because he survived his attack. The former deputy attorney general said that we need to start treating uh, domestic terrorism in the same way that we treat foreign terrorism. So that would mean surveillance. That would mean listening to chatter on the Internet. That would also mean intervening and trying to stop crimes before they happen. That is extremely tricky here in the U.S. We have a definition for domestic terrorism. It's the use of violence in order to coerce a population. It's the use of violence in order to try to get a message across or to change the political landscape. But we don't have a criminal statute. And we also have First Amendment rights here in the United States. So if you're an American citizen, you can be a member of a hate group and you can you can say hateful things on the Internet. But until you commit a crime, it's very difficult to step in. We actually had a, a computer analyst, Andrew Thompson, look at this kind of verbiage being used on places like 4chan. And we found that hate crimes and hate speech often, but not always, peaked around the same times and often around political rhetoric. Yeah, I mean, there's a straight line from these chans and some of these other message boards right through to Donald Trump and his campaign's messaging and communications, and that line goes right through Fox News. Democrats know if they keep up the flood of illegals into the country, they can eventually turn it into a flood of voters for them. Their political success does not depend on good policies, but on demographic replacement, and they'll do anything to make sure it happens. It's absolutely absurd to, to, to connote that this is in some way um, an invasion, and it has real consequences. That's part of what we saw in El Paso, right? We know that that gunman drove to El Paso with the express intent of fighting an invasion. He allegedly cased, cased the place looking for Mexicans to kill, so there is a very clear line here from one to the other. There's a, something in, in sort of white nationalist circles called replacement theory, right? That, yep. that the great mm -hmm. replacement. So uh, the great replacement theory, in a nutshell, is that uh, the Jewish people. Uh, are replacing white Americans uh, with foreigners, in this case immigrants from, uh, from, the border, from, from south of the border. If replace rings a vague, sinister bell, well, that may be because of Charlottesville, where, of course, Trump proclaimed good people on both sides, because it was there in Charlottesville that white nationalists openly marched against racial minorities and against Jews and chanted about not being replaced. And in the case of El Paso, you have a community that is reeling from two simultaneous traumas. It's the scourge of gun violence that we have seen uh, happen repeatedly in this country. But there is also this idea of weaponized white supremacy that is growing in this country. And this is just the latest example of that. It's something that is a nationwide problem. And usually a job of a president is to try to be a healer at a time of division and President Trump has shown that that is a demonstrable weak spot. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.